Good evening. I am Sherelle Williams, Marketing and Program Outreach Associate at the Center for Black Literature at Medgar's College. On behalf of the center, welcome to this evening's John Oliver Killens Reading Series Program. For tonight's special program celebrating National Poetry Month, we are delighted to be partnering with one of the center's longest supporters, Book Brooklyn Public Library. This evening's program is an example is an example of the importance the center sees in collaborating to present engaging and informative public programs like the one we are hosting tonight. We all benefit when we work together. It is now my pleasure to introduce Meredith Waters, director, program, and exhibitor at Brooklyn Public Library. Enjoy tonight's program. Thank you very much for that introduction. And let me tell you on behalf of Brooklyn Public Library, the Center for Black Literature is one of our favorite collaborators. We've worked together for over 15 years uh, on, on various projects. And then when Clarence came on as the director of the Center for Black Literature, you know, knocking on a decade ago, everything just went to another level. It was really terrific. And my, my only regret tonight is that we're not able to welcome you into Central Library. We'll be doing that again soon, but um, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad everybody's ready for this terrific, terrific event with uh, Talib and Akiba. I know I'm excited. Um, I just wanna tell you about one event from Brooklyn Public Library that you might be interested in, and that's next Sunday on April 18th at four o'clock. We will be with um, Teju Cole, and it's presented alongside Carnegie Hall and the Orchestra of St. Luke's, and Teju Cole is gonna read his short story, Radia, and he's curated different pieces for the Orchestra of St. Luke's to perform. It's gonna be a beautiful program, Sunday, April 18th at four, and following that concert, uh, he will be uh, there to take your questions and explain any uh, process questions that you may have for him. So delighted to be here, honored to be a part of the John Oliver Killens reading series. And I am very delighted to introduce Clarence Reynolds, the director for the Center of Black Literature. Well, well, thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Sherelle. And thank you, audience, for joining us this evening for this John Oliver Killings Reading Series program celebrating National Poetry Month. We're delighted to have you join us for what's going to be an exciting program featuring Talib Kweli and Akiba Solomon. They're going to be discussing his book, Vibrate Higher. Uh, the center was founded in 20, 2002 to present programs such as this one, where we offer writers, poets, scholars in the literary field to talk about their books, to talk about the nature of books, to talk about the climate in which writers create their works. On behalf of Dr. Brenda Green and the staff at the Center for Black Literature, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I also wanna thank our one of our sponsors, Amazon Literary Partnerships, for helping us to support to present this program. Tonight, we're gonna to have a wonderful program, as I mentioned, with Talib Kweli and Akiba Solomon. Talib Kweli is a Brooklyn-based hip-hop artist, entrepreneur, and activist. Kweli earned recognition early on through his collaboration with fellow Brooklyn rapper Most Death when they formed the group Black Star. Kweli's musical career continued with solo success, including collaborations with producers and rappers Kanye West, Just Blaze, and Pharrell Williams. His most recent solo album is titled Gotham, and in 2011, he quality found his own record label, Javodi Media, which is also a platform that releases music, films, and books. He is also the host of the podcast, The People's Party with Philippe Kweli. For more information, visit him on his website, www.talibkweli.com. Also joining him in conversation will be Akila Sol Akiba Solomon. Akiba is the senior editor at the Marshall Project. She is a National Association of Black Journalists award-winning journalist from West Philadelphia. 
The Howard University graduate has served as senior editor, I'm sorry, senior director at Color Lines and has written about culture, the intersection between gender and race for Descent, Essence, Glamour, and Pause magazines. Solomon has also been a health editor for Essence magazine. She's also been the researcher and a senior editor for the print versions of Vibe Vixen and The Source. Solomon has co-authored How We Fight White Supremacy, A Field Guide to Black Resistance, a collection of essays by writers, political and social activists, artists, scholars, journalists, comedians, and filmmakers who share their thoughts, thoughts about how they fight white supremacy. Before we move into the conversation with Akiba and Talib, Mr. Kwali is going to bless us with a few with a reading from his book. So enjoy our program, and I'd like you to welcome Talib Kwali. Read from chapter twelve. It's called "The Best Is Yet to Come." Uh, growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. Chili Davis. Since I, was no lo since I was no longer attending classes at New York University, my dormitory style apartment at 3rd North had devolved into a hangout spot for my friends and me. Juju and Rubik's would often spend nights sleeping on the couches or the floors, wherever they could find a space. One of my roommates, Damon, who had met at Tisch and who had become a five percenter and changed his name to Devon, invited a childhood friend from Cincinnati, Cornell Gibson, to stay with us for a week. Cornell, who changed his name to Omari almost immediately after setting foot in New York City, was enamored with New York's hip hop lifestyle. Growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio, Omari often felt that life there was too slow and dreamed about moving to the city where his favorite hip hop artists came from. His heroes were rap acts like Gangstar, J. Ru the Damager, and the Brooklyn collective known as the Boot Camp Click. He would often, he would often quote KRS-One from the hip hop documentary Rhyme and Reason, saying, until you stand on a corner in the South Bronx, you are not hip hop. And taking the subway to the South Bronx is one of the first things he did when he arrived. He loved to buy weed from the bodegas on the street corners that Black Moon rapper Buckshot described in his verses. And Omari was, Omari was absolutely giddy when we started bringing him to hip hop events around the city that we had access to. When the week Omari was supposed to stay was up, he was so deeply in love with New York City that he decided not to go back to Cincinnati. Now five of us, were living in a dorm room that was designed for two, and the summer was quickly approaching. We decided to look for jobs so that we could afford a place in Brooklyn. Omari scored first, finding we handed out flyers to promote parties for Danny Castro and Anthony Marshall, the founders of a monthly hip hop event called the Lyricist Lounge. Omari's passion for hip hop and his willingness to do what it took to be around it at all times impressed Danny and Anthony, and they saw his energy as an asset to what they were doing. I too was determined to find a job that would align with my interests. I decided that I would only be comfortable working at a bookstore or a record store. Starting in Times Square, I walked downtown dropping resumes off at every book and record shop I could think of. A week later, I started at Grand Army Plaza in Park Slope and repeated this process. After about a half hour, I arrived at Incurable Books on Flatbush and St. Mark's Avenue, Brooklyn's first black owned bookstore. Incurable was founded by a young woman named Leothi Miller Owens. Noticing the lack of quality books available for black children in Brooklyn, she rented a ground floor, a ground floor space at 76 St. Mark's Avenue in the heart of Park Slope and filled it with books most black parents had never heard of or were never able to find. She called her store in Kiru, an Igbo word that loosely translates to the best is yet to come. When the multicultural education movement of the late 1980s hit Brooklyn, and Kiru Books was in a prime position to capitalize on it, quickly becoming a one-stop shop for all multicultural literary needs. Helping Leothi out was her good friend, Cynthia Johnson, otherwise known as CJ. CJ was well-known in Brooklyn's Black community and used her relationships to bring in clientele that Leothi did not have access to. One of CJ's ideas was to focus on uh, in-store book readings and signings. And she started off with a newly famous author named Terry McMillan, who lived on St. Mark's half a block from Incubo Books. Because of, because, of the success of the, because of the success of the McMillan in-store and the many that followed, Incubo became known as a must-visit location for Black writers. When Leothi passed away untimely at age 40, her mother, Miss Adelaide Miller, came in and furthered her daughter's legacy by keeping the store alive. Miss Miller was a throwback, an old school teacher who refused to use computers because she didn't trust them. She hired her sister Marilyn to be the bookkeeper and they worked hard to continue Leothi's vision. Miss Miller and Marilyn would stay in the back of the store while CJ ran the floor. CJ hired her friend Paulette Mapp and a young man named Aaron Sims. 
The day when I walked into a queue looking for a job, CJ was behind the counter and I impressed him with my knowledge of books. I was hired on the spot. CJ told me that they could use a younger energy at the store and I was put to work immediately, mopping and sweeping, receiving book orders and shelving them. On occasion, work in the cash register. When Aaron, while Aaron was only a couple years older than me, my love for hip hop culture brought Inkiru into a younger frame of mind. Aaron was more into jazz and dressed more like an adult than I did. He reminded me of Denzel Washington's character, Bleak Gilliam from Spike Lee's Mo Better Blues, the way he was always hanging out at jazz clubs and meeting new women. While Aaron didn't know much about the books on the shelves, he was a superior conversationalist, often keeping, often keeping female customers who just wandered in off the street entertained for an hour or more. These customers would always buy from Aaron because they liked him so much. CJ and Paulette were both my parents' age, but CJ had long flowing dreadlocks, a Pan-African outlook, and a fondness for Afrocentric clothing that made her look younger than her years. CJ was animated, knowledgeable about the books, and passionate about Leothi's vision. Paulette was a feminist and could tell you everything you wanted to know about writers such as Bell Hooks and Toni Morrison. I rounded out this motley crew when CJ hired me. This was my fifth job. Now that I had a new job, it was time to find an apartment. After weeks of looking, I found a five bedroom duplex in the yard with a yard for $1,500 on Classen and Gates Avenue in the heart of, in the heart of Bedford Stuyvesant. I secured the apartment in my name and we assembled a cast of five roommates, me, Omari Devine, and a budding producer named Lunatic, a dude named Blue who also worked for the Lyricist Lounge. Omari and I were first to move in. We were surprised to find a dog hobbling back and forth in the backyard. Unsure what to do with it, Omari and I decided to go find the local weed spot. We figured we would smoke until a solution popped in our heads. We put our money together, which amounted to $5, and headed to a bodega a couple of blocks down that we thought had to be a weed spot from the way that it looked. It was dark inside, and all the food on the shelves was outdated. When I asked for a nickel bag, the dude behind the bulletproof glass handed me a small bag of white powder. What's this, I said. He replied, a nickel bag. Do you want it or not? Coke definitely wasn't it for us, and we got out of there heading to our old faithful spot on Franklin Avenue in Crown Heights. When we arrived back at the apartment an hour later, the sick dog in the backyard was now a dead dog in the backyard. After we smoked, we figured out that we should call the ASPCA. We told them that the dog was still alive, fearing that they wouldn't come for a dead dog. They never came anyway, and when we woke up the next morning, Omari and I put on dishwashing gloves, shoved that dog into a hefty bag, and put it on a curb in front of the crack house across the street. Welcome to the neighborhood indeed. Soon after I moved into the apartment, it was clear that I would be the only one paying the rent. By midsummer, the apartment was occupied by only, by, only by Omari and me, and I was the only one with a job. My monthly salary was not enough to cover my bills, so I cut corners by walking to work. Two, two miles there, two miles back every day. Makiba, ever the nurturer, would often come over with food and cook for us. We were learning how to take care of each other. One morning as I was leaving for work, Omari came through the door with one of my favorite rappers, Mike and I, from the legendary group Freestyle Fellowship. I was greatly inspired by Freestyle Fellowship, but Micah was my favorite, and I was shocked to see him standing in the door of my best style apartment, not just because he was a famous rapper, but because he was a famous rapper from South Central Los Angeles. Micah explained that he was staying with his manager, Kedar Massenburg, in an apartment around the corner and was looking for a place in Brooklyn to settle down and record his debut solo album. Omari spotted him at the local bodega while on an early morning blunt run and explained, them, explained to him how big of a fan I was. So Micah decided to come by and meet me. We smoked and had a classic freestyle session that I will never forget. I was late for work that day, but it was worth it. Micah's manager, Kedar Massenburg, had recently made a name for himself as the manager of Erica Badu, a brand new soul singer from Dallas, Texas, who was taking the industry by storm and who had also made her home in Brooklyn. Kidar was also gearing up to roll out his latest artist, a passionate R&B singer named D'Angelo. Kidar shared an apartment with Lance Un Rivera, a, a friend of Biggie's, who would go on to start the label Entertainment and get into a famous altercation with Jay-Z years later, and Daddy-O from the classic hip hop group Stetsasonic. I grew up on Stetsasonic, and I relished the opportunity to chop it up with one of my childhood heroes. So I, I would go spend time at that apartment just to soak up the vibe. Micah and I became fast friends, and I learned a lot from him in a short time. Towards the end of the summer, Micah gave us $500, $500 as a down payment on a couple months rent and moved into the apartment with Omari and me. Kidar was not happy with this decision and showed up at the front door to get the money back. I think he felt that Micah needed his own space rather than being roommates with us. Even though Kedar was adamant, I backed him off. 
telling him that this money situation was between him and Micah, not him and me. However, a couple of days later, Micah moved out and got his own spot. Omari and I also had a bad argument over some things in the apartment, so I asked him to leave. Stuck with a $1,500 duplex and no roommates to help me with the rent, I gave up the apartment and moved back into my mom's basement. If having to move back home wasn't enough to make me feel defeated, I also lost my job at Incurable Books that September. CJ told me that she liked me as an employee, but August was a notoriously rough month on independent booksellers, so they couldn't afford my salary. So now not only was I not in school, but I had no job and I was, living, and I was back living with my mom. I felt empty, shattered. I began questioning my life's decisions. Being adult was not seeming like fun. My mom, was gracious, my mom was gracious enough to not charge me rent, but on one condition, that I go to school, any school, to educator and Dr. Brenda Green could not stomach having a college dropout son. By this time, hip hop music had engulfed me in every sense of the word. I had no space in my brain to think about anything else. Since I was still living under Brenda Green's roof, still I was living under Brenda Green's roof. So to please her, I took night, night classes where she was employed, Mega Rivers College, located in the heart of Crown Heights. The only class I could find at Mega that dealt with music was a radio communications class, but I hated it because I knew more about the current world of radio than my professor did. So now my focus turned to getting a job. Deciding that I no longer had the luxury of trying to find work at only a book or record store, I set out to find any job. I spent that summer walking around the city, dropping resumes off with whoever would take one. After one exhausting morning of searching, I headed to my favorite place in the city, Washington Square Park, to sit and eat lunch. A light-skinned brother with green eyes and what appeared to be an S-curl sat next to me, pulled out a bag of weed and asked if I had an extra cigar. I did. I gave him the spare Dutch master that I usually had in my pocket. and we, be we began smoking and chopping it up. Let's call him Puma. Puma, who claimed to be a stockbroker, explained that he had the cure for my financial woes and offered me a job with his company. I told him I had zero Wall Street experience and he said it didn't matter. Puma explained that Wall Street was a hustle and if I had hustle, I could succeed. He gave me an address in the financial district at which to show up at 9 a.m. the next day, and he provided me with only one instruction, wear a tie. When I arrived the next morning, I was ushered into a loud room full of young dudes on phones. On the surface, they appeared to be selling stocks. Puma told me that my job was to get on the phone and convince people to buy stocks they might not otherwise have paid attention to. I would be working on commission, so the more stocks I sold, the more I would make. I wanted to know more about what I was convincing people to spend their money on so that I could be a better salesperson. However, when I started asking questions about the stocks I was selling, Puma got tight, quick, annoyed. He responded, don't worry about all of that. Just get the credit card numbers. This seemed fishy to me. I tried for about an hour, but the people I called were suspicious, making it impossible for me to make a sales pitch and sound as if I meant it. I went back to Puma and asked him some more questions about what we were doing until he got annoyed enough to break it down for me. He told me that these were dummy stocks, stocks that did not exist, and that people were calling, we, the people we were calling had so much money they would not notice or care. So we were stealing from people. This did not sit right with me, and I knew that I would never be good at it. So when I got my first lunch break, I left and I never went back. The first thing I did when I got outside was take my tie off. After my bad luck with the job search and my boiler room experience with Puma, I realized I wasn't cut out for a job and I began to pay more attention to my career. I knew that working all day at a job I did not like would kill me, no matter how much it paid. I went back to Incubo Books and I begged for my job again, but CJ was only able to hire me for the holiday season. I did just that and by the beginning of December, I was back at Incubo. This time I worked so hard that I became indispensable. I scoured the bookshelves and I devoured the books. I fell in love with authors like Octavia Butler, Paulo Coelho, Ikwe Arma, and Marimba Ani. I knew where every book was located. I knew the stock by heart, and I equipped myself to sell any book we had to anybody who came through the door. That December, I also told my mom that I was going to stop attending classes at Mega Rivers and try night classes at New York University instead. By January 1995, I was enrolled in a music business class and a Western religious class at NYU. The music business class was as obsolete given the current fluid music business as I was interested in as the radio communication class at Mega was, but the Western religion class was enthralling. At that time, I spent a lot of time trying to understand why there was so much religious hate and division in the world. And the most important takeaway I got from this class was that all religions were trying to answer the same questions. I began to see the similarities in religions rather than the differences. And this changed the way I viewed religion and spirituality as a whole. The lessons I took from reading Malcolm years earlier had been abstract, but when living in the world and experiencing spirituality for myself, 
excuse me, the lessons I took from reading Malcolm years earlier had been abstract, but living in the world and experiencing spirituality for myself was a different beast. My professor was a Catholic man who was married to a Jewish woman, but he spoke of Islam like an Islamic scholar. I hadn't been aware people like him existed and taking his class allowed me to understand that it is possible to have equal respect for all religions and all ways of life. Thank you. Ooh. What's good, what's good? Hi. Hmm. What's up, Akiva? Oh, yeah, hi. So let me let me jump right in. How you feeling? Good. How are you? Long good. time to see. Yeah, it's been a been a good minute. Yeah, it has. It has. So, you know, you, you gave people a taste of the book. Um, but there was one thing that I wanted to talk about before we like got into the discussion. Okay. It was about the title of the book. And there's actually a part that you wrote that I really like the way you put it. So I'm going to actually do a little more reading if folks. Okay. Like okay. That. Sure. 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 I'm reading from Vibrate Higher Reps. Yes. Yeah. So I'm glad you have a copy. I, yes. I left my copy at the last place I was at. I forgot to bring it. That's why I was late with the call. I apologize. No, it's all good. It's all good. So you said, um, you say, we see light because of vibrations. Colors represent the vibration of waves at different frequencies. We also hear sounds because of vibrations. When you repeat a word over and over like a mantra, it is not just the meaning of the word that tattoos itself on your consciousness. It is also the vibration that emanates from the sound of the word. I experienced this firsthand on my first tour, the Spit Kicker Tour, with De La Soul, Common, Feral Manch, and Biz Markey in 2000. And the De La Soul song, Stakes Is High, which samples James Brown's mind power, Maceo Parker repeats the words vibe and vibration. So to introduce the song, all of us on a tour would join De La on stage and tell the crowd that when we said vibe, we wanted them to say vibration. We would reply, stakes is high. I saw the effect of our, mon our mantra had on the crowd. Every night we got them to vibrate higher. And I read that because it, it, I think it really sums up what the book is about. So can you just talk a little bit more about the idea of vibrating higher? And also, if you want to talk to us about the Spit Kicker Tour, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, well, those are my OGs and my senseis. And um, I learned so much from them. Um, I became a man on, on that tour. I feel like, I really feel like when I think back to the Spit Kicker Tour, I went from a boy to a man. Mm -hmm because um, there were things I experienced on that tour. Um, I learned what worked for me and what did not work for me. Um, I came home from that tour <laughs> and I thought I was dying <laughs> because I had gone so hard. I had gone so hard and doing so many toxic things on mm -hmm. the road every night. We were like a, pan we were like a band of pirates. <laughs> it was like if me, me, De La Soul, Common, Falmanch, Bismarcky, and we were like a band of mercenaries, like, like running through towns. And um, I came back home and I would, I was exhausted and I would go to sleep and I'd wake up and the entire bed would be soaked with sweat. Wow. And this happened like three nights in a row. And I was like, something's wrong with me. I'm sick. I don't know what I did out there on the road. I went to the doctor and he said, you're just exhausted. Mm. He said, these are just toxins that are leaving your body. Wow. Um, and so that was an interesting experience to me. And I changed the way very quickly that I toured based mm. on that tour. But I mean, I learned a lot about stage perform craft and, um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, to bring it back to talking about the book, that was a very real experience for me. And um, just vibe, just, just, just sometimes as a creative person, you might be in a relationship and if you're not in a relationship with someone who understands the creative process, they might not understand that part, at least what I do, and I'm sure you do the same thing as a writer, is sometimes you have to just sit with your thoughts, or sometimes you have to like create an atmosphere and create a vibe in order to which create. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that could be explained. Other creatives know it, they recognize it, or they see it when it's happening. But some people are like, you ain't doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not doing nothing. And that's, and that's the part of it that I think creates this uh, uh, I don't want to say fraternity uh, because that word feels like just dudes, but create this, 
<laughs> creates this uh, this feeling between artists um, mm -hmm. that 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 connects us in, in a certain way. And so things like the De La Soul thing and things like uh, Andre 3000's uh, Vibrate from that Outcast album he did, like that song is so minimalist. And I'm such a lyricist, but that song resonated with me so much. And whenever I thought about my career, that song was very helpful to me because I feel like I'm not perfect. I'm very flawed in many ways, but I feel like the, the, what my career has always been about, what my narrative has been about, is trying to, is trying to elevate and trying to elevate the conversation and trying to elevate, uh, uh, trying to move away from our base self to just you know a higher vibration. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to sound like I, I do a bunch of yoga because I don't. <laughs> I've been planning to start. I think yoga sounds like a good idea, but um, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm not like you know, I'm not like. I, I respect all of those philosophies and practices, um, and I, I, I take as much as I can from them. Yeah, I mean, one thing that you also talk a lot about a lot in the book that I think is interesting is spirituality and a sort of unconventional path toward it. And so, you know, in the beginning of the book, you talk about you talk a lot about uh, five percent, and you talk about the culture of Islam, which was, you know, huge at the time uh, that that you and I came to be. Um, and then, you know, toward the end, you kind of come into your own spiritually. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that process? Yeah. Um, I think that has a lot to do. I have to give hip hop some credit for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because my parents are, um, they were both raised Christian. Mm -hmm. So I was raised with those sort of uh, black uh, Christian values, you know, but not like Southern Baptist, you know, more like New York thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and so it wasn't, a, it was, but it wasn't a thing where my parents were, were dogmatic at all, or even pressed to go to church. If we made it to church, we made it to church. That's what it was. And so I had this very, uh, I think because of that looseness, maybe I was able to question the church mm -hmm. more, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I think in hip hop, well, you can't really be at the point when I came into hip hop, you couldn't be one of the best unless you were dealing with consciousness and dealing with trying to uplift the people. It was just, yeah. there was no route to greatness without doing that. Yeah. And if yeah. you were going to do that, you disproportionately came from 5% or came from some sort of Islamic background. That's just, and that's because hip hop is a music that come from the streets largely disproportionately and these are and this is a these philosophies made its way into the music um and so the best rappers of my day we're talking about we, we all talk about at this age we want to see a Kane versus Rakim um mm -hmm. versus yeah well you had to be god body to even understand or at least around that community to even understand what they was talking about at that time and so it's like in order to just be one of the best you had to be at least cognizant of what was going on in, in, in spirituality in very, very black communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that definitely, that definitely was a factor. And I think part of what's interesting about your journey and what you also write about in the book is being raised by black cultural nationalists and how that raising um, actually dovetailed with what was happening in hip hop. And that was part of how, you know, you came to your own style and your own um, your own content and writing. Yeah. Talk about a, a bit what it was to be, because I was raised in a similar environment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always interesting for me now because, you know, on social media or just in general, you know, the the word woke is, is irking me at this point, but <laughs> the whole, but, the, but the, the wokeness, the mm -hmm. amount of outward discussion about a uh, black culture and black politics was not present when we were coming up. Right. So talk about what it was to come up in the 80s as a black cultural nationalist and then what it felt like to have a youth culture or the music actually reinforce what you were hearing at, 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 at home. Um, well, I mean, it was just, it was awesome because there's, I, there's so much good about the hip hop music, particularly from 1988, which I write about in the book. And around the, around that time, and how black it was, and how pro black it was, how all everybody was moving on some sort of code. It seemed like, which is like you you can't like, I got I got a shout out LL Cool J. 
Um, and I got to shout out Slick Rick, even though Slick Rick did Children's Store, not, he, not, not Children's Store, but uh, Hey Young World, which could be considered a, hip, a conscious hip hop record. But mm -hmm. Slick Rick and LL Cool J are really the only ones from that era who found a path to greatness without being overtly conscious. That's and so got to yeah. shout them out because somehow they managed to do it. Yeah. Um, but um, back then, um, there had there was a connection there, because there was no internet, and I'm a fan of the internet. You know, I, I think that I think that the internet can largely connect people who need to be connected. There's a lot of great things you can do, but everything is a blessing. There's a gift and a curse um, in many ways, and we didn't have the internet back then, so there was no way for you to participate in that movement talk or the activist talk unless you were connected to it. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't really fake the funk as easily back then. You had to, you know, you had to be, you had to go actually visit communities and be there doing the work for you to be considered someone who would be what the equivalent of woke is back then. Mm -hmm. And what, what I find now, while I'm, I'm very excited about, I, I enjoy representation. I think representation matters. And um, I like seeing people represent surface wise black culture in, in, in ways that we've never seen it before. It's like, I was watch, I don't watch TV that, that much that, that, so, that often anymore, but I was like up late at night and MTV two was on and they were playing like back to back Martin reruns, mm. um, which tracks for them. I get why that would work for them, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? MTV two, but they showed like commercials for black ink or the black ink yeah. crew, right? Yeah. And it was like this whole thing where they were like, yeah, we're gonna go on this march and Black Lives Matter. And the whole commercial was sort of co-opting what these images of what they think black activism is. And I'm like, I, I, I understood that it was mainstream, but I didn't realize it was that mainstream. Yeah. To the point where it's like, oh, now that there's TV commercials where we're showing you how we're how woke we are. It just it, and I'll I, I, I tried not to be petty in my brain about it. I tried not to be like, you know what I'm saying? Like I tried to, because I, the, the black people on the screen, I'm sure their intentions were pure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're trying their best to do what they can, but the, the, whole, the whole commodification of it that's around them, I'm just, mm -hmm. I've just experienced enough to know, to, you know, to call bullshit on some of that. And, um, and so when you have something like that, where it's not connected to the activists, it's not, forget like the people that we came up on, like as far like a Sonia Sanchez or, you know, like a, you know, forget like a, I a, a John Henry Clark or Dr. Ben or these, you know. And Dr. Brenda Green. You forget, you know, they, they not, they not, they don't know about them people. They don't, they don't know about us. They don't know about Akiba Solomon. They don't know about Monifa Bendele. They don't know about Talib Kweli. They don't know about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, so much it's not not so much not at all about name recognition it's not a, at all about that but it's about there is a connection whether it's music or whether it's activism i stand firmly on the shoulders of my ancestors mm -hmm. if i'm not mentioning the people who came before me if i'm not mentioning the people who put in the work before me then mm -hmm. what am i out here talking about at all mm -hmm. we, we we cannot lose that connection and that's the that's the one criticism i have of some of the newer ways that people are moving in space. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one thing that you've always done, um, and and I should just give a little bit of background. I've known um, Talib for quite a while. You um, met in the street. Yes, uh, you <laughs> go to Nkuru Books. Actually, bought Fortified Live from Nkuru Books <laughs> under the counter, um, and and that was just such a it was such an important space, um, and there was so much important cultural work happening that at the time, you know, I, I, I didn't look around and say, this is important cultural work, but mm -hmm. you look back um, and you capture this in your book, you know, how there is this continuity between like the black arts movement folks and then our generation and then the generation to follow. Um, but one thing that I think has always been progressive about you is that you have embraced new technology um, I remember being at the source one time and you came up and you were playing music for, you know, some of us staff members. And then you just said something like, y'all are so out of touch because we weren't on the internet like that. 
<laughs> and that moment stuck with me because at the time I was like, I don't want to go on the internet, whatever. Like, you know, they'll, they'll come up to the office and play it, you know, whatever. But, um, but yeah, talk about how you've always been open to like these new forms of communication and jumping on um, something, I, I guess, being an early adopter. Well, I'm, I gotta say, I'm I, I was definitely late to the internet, so I don't know why I would have said that to you. I, <laughs> I guess I was feeling myself. You know what I'm saying? I was like, "What, y'all? Y'all not here?" You know what I'm saying? Like, but I didn't even I didn't I didn't own a computer. I didn't own a laptop. I think I had a PC in my house, but I didn't use it for anything. I didn't own a laptop until two thousand four, um, when I started seeing what was going on with the OK Player community, mm. and I wanted to be a part of that. And um, for a long time with the OK Player community, I had a positive experience. Then I had a very negative experience with that community. So I was, I, I swore off the internet for years. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but what got me back on the internet in terms of the music space was MySpace. MySpace uh, was very, very good to me. I was mm -hmm. able to connect with a lot of fans. MySpace was good until it just wasn't popping no more. Um, but as far as me being early, I was, I was the, the first artist to release a full album on Spotify. I was the first artist to release projects on Second Life, if you remember Second Life. Mm -hmm. I am not, I am, did, I am analog. I am completely analog. Like, I don't know how to do any of this. I'm not, that's, but, I, but, I, but I'm ambitious and I understand that the music business is set up to take advantage of artists. So mm -hmm. because my priority is to get my music out and, to get, and I know, I understand that my relationship with the fans my, my relationship is that the onus is on me as an artist to figure out how to get my art to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not the artist that sits around complaining, like, why don't people buy my music? Why don't nobody support me? Why don't I get no support? No, 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 no. If I'm going to call myself an artist, then that, the onus is on me. Now, does that seem fair? Who knows? That's a philosophical debate. But mm -hmm. that's just what it is. Mm -hmm. And if I don't put the onus on myself to get the music to you, wherever you're at, then I can't be an artist professionally for a living. Now, it's my job to find better and more efficient ways to do that. And throughout my career, I've been, been blessed to be able to do that. But it's, it's really from what you're speaking to is a, from a love of the art and a, a, a desire to make sure I get it out. Um, I'm not a tech whiz. I'm not cutting edge. I'm not, I don't know what the kids are doing or saying, you know. <laughs> but I, I do know that it's on me to get the music out to the fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting when you talk about how the record industry is set up still, but, you know, this idea even of distribution and how that's sort of like the last frontier to a certain extent and finding ways yeah. around that, um, you know, talk a bit more about just this side of it. And also, I actually want to bring in your children for a second because both of your children are artists, yep, right? Yep. So... How do you mentor them? I mean, you now having had this whole career mm -hmm. um, and, and what you read in the beginning about how, you know, you were marauders out in the streets acting crazy and toxicity <laughs> and all the rest of it. How do you now mentor your children as artists? Um, that's a great question because it's not, that's not easy to do. Um, my children, uh, my daughter put out a song where she talked about stuff in, you know, personal stuff in my relationship with her mother. Mm -hmm. And she also talked about um, how she went on tour with me and the things she saw and how that made her want to be an artist. And how could she not want to be an artist after going on tour? And it's like, that's not what I was trying to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, I was just trying to see my daughter, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, my son talking to them because it's like, they don't, they, they both have this thing where they don't want to be seen as, art, artists seen as my children as artists and they're right to feel that way. Um, but it's hard for me because sometimes I see them doing stuff. So I'm like, no, just listen to me. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Come with me. It'd be it's so much doper over here. You don't have to live like that. Come with, come, come, come holler at your boy, you know? And I, you know, but I, I, I appreciate the fact that they resist that. And I appreciate the fact that they make it on their own. And now as they're maturing, they're getting older, they're becoming less apprehensive 
about asking me things and mm-hmm. asking my advice and coming to me. And that's a really good feeling because it's been a couple of years of me being like, I wouldn't do that if I was you, but <laughs> they're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's how it works. But, you know, it's a funny thing. I went to a show. I happened to go to a show um, and I heard, you know, somebody rhyming and it was really interesting. And then somebody told me that it was your son. Yeah, he's really, and he's really had, cool. <laughs> It's like, first of all, I felt incredibly old. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then it was just, you know, again, it's just so interesting to, to see the progression um, and to see, you know, again, from sort of the beginning um, and, and this sort of consciousness that was around. And then we went through like the gangster period. And I just think right, like right now we're in a really incredibly creative moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I did notice in the chat, somebody said, what about Kendrick Lamar? As we were talking about conscious hip hop. Um, and so there was a point that you made in the book where you talked about J. Cole and you talked about Kendrick mm-hmm. and how, you know, they are NCs who, have consciousness who talk, you know, engage in politics and that sort of thing, but don't brand themselves that way. Mm-hmm. And so talk a bit about, you know, the conscious label and 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 what it means now as opposed to what it meant even mm-hmm. 10 years ago. Well, I think we have to, as artists who, who are called that and who sometimes do that type of music, we have to control that narrative because if we don't, they will use it against us. Uh, Complex Magazine, um, Complex was to get started by Echo. I'm fr- uh, friends with Mark Echo. I, I used to be a, a model for Echo um, oh. back in the day. <laughs> in my modeling days, when I used to model hip oversized hip hop clothing. Um, you know, Complex is a huge behemoth in our, in our culture as far as media, right? People listen to them and people, you know, read Complex and check out their lists and all that. And um, they wrote an article. It was years, some years ago. The article was called Why Conscious Rap is Condescending and Corny was the name of the article. And then the picture they had was like a picture of me, right? So I read this article and it was like, and it was like 30 reasons, you know, they do the list. And it was like 30 reasons why conscious rap is condescending and corny. corny. I'm like, they got 30, 30 reasons? So I read this list and um, I'll be honest with you, uh, there's there's large aspects of conscious rap that are condescending and corny. And I agreed with aspects of their list, but none of it had to do with me. Yeah. Not a lick of it. And so I called them out on it. I must've called them out on the social media and uh, they reached out to me and the writer reached out to me and we talked and I, I gave him my point of view and he ended up agreeing with me. And then we did an interview like a couple of days later which in which I broke down their list and said why they're incorrect and why what they missed. And I, I explained to them why it's so dangerous for them to make a list like that. It's very ir- irresponsible for a quote unquote hip hop publication to, to, to do that. Um, because, you know, back be- in the era before me, when you had Fresh Fest, rest in peace to John Fletcher, um, Houdini would go out with. NWA and De La Soul and Public Enemy is like, mm-hmm. if you if you got that, if you got that bop, you got that bop. It doesn't matter what you, you don't have to be conscious, you don't have to be gangster, you mm-hmm. you just the art is the art. Um and the art comes first. I, I know that as a conscious rapper. The reason why I'm successful as a conscious rapper is not the conscious part, it's the rapper part. Mm-hmm. I'm a good rapper, I pay attention to my craft. And mm-hmm. so I'm able to keep going. Even when people get tired of hearing me, people are like, I don't want to hear quality. Here you come with that consciousness again. People get tired of that. And I still am able to be successful um, at, at great odds against me, like every other conscious art, artist from Rhapsody to Lupe to Common to everybody else. It's like mm-hmm. the odds are against us mm-hmm. um, to be successful. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I just, I, I can so relate to that too, you know, having been in media and having these kinds of um, debates with folks. Um, who didn't come from the same place. Um, and so, you know, th- what you said about it being incredibly dangerous, I think is such an important point because, um, you know, we're talking about a broad culture. We're talking about a culture that, again, is connected to what came before us and what's gonna come after us. And writing it off, you know, as, as, as boring 
um, really does undermine, um, I think, the important work that happens that is in, that goes along with the art. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing I want to talk about right now is the work that you did in Ferguson. There's a part in the book where you talk about how you and Jessica Caremore and Rosa Clemente, shout to, to Rosa um, and Jessica, um, that you went to Ferguson and that uh, you met T. Dubbo and you met Tuff Poe mm -hmm. and you know you were out with the folks who were organizing and who were um, protesting and speaking out about what happened to Mike Brown but also just in general about police brutality and then you had this encounter with police and it got really um, tight for you. So talk about being an artist but then at the same time being you know, or or like being in a place where movement is happening. Yeah, thank you um, for asking about that. Um, well, first, definitely rest in peace to Mike Brown because I try to make sure that when I talk about this stuff, I try to center the person who that I even went down there for, mm -hmm. um, and his family and, and and what they're trying to do. Um, as an artist, I had already established myself as a artist willing to do activist work as a conscious artist and and i'd done that so well that i almost was in a place where if i didn't ever go out for anything else i'd be fine people would never question my activism based on the work i've done already based on pre previous work but that felt like a very dishonest uncomfortable space for me um and when i was tweeting about what was going on in ferguson and then i i got a call from j cole and he was like, I'm in Ferguson, um, but I don't quite know who to reach out to or what to do. Could you help me plug me in with some folks? And that made me really think about what I was doing because I'm not, J. Cole is a hugely successful artist. Um, you know, God bless the bro, God, God bless me. So good at what he does and he has done it his own way. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, if J. Cole can afford to take time out of his schedule to go to Ferguson, well, certainly Talib Kweli can. Mm. And, and I just found myself sitting there like, why am I tweeting about it? And J. Cole is calling me like I'm there. Mm -hmm. um, I should be there. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's really through the arts, me, me seeing another artist and be like, oh, and reminding me of what I, what I have done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I went down there and um, my plan was to go down there to spend a night, because I did that a year before I went to the state capitol um, and met the Dream Defenders in, in Tallahassee. And I spent a night, it was such, it was so dope for me. And that I, that connected me to a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. But um, I was like, I'm gonna go spend the night in solidarity with the people. And I felt like as an artist who I am, that would be a good show of solidarity. Cause I also have other things to do. I got business thing. I got things to do. I'm, I'm touring. There wasn't a pandemic. So I was on the road. I had songs to record everything. Cause I was like, I'm going to spend the night. And when I got there, I met everybody on the ground. And when it got dark, it just got real that night. Mm -hmm. I brought uh, Rosa and Jessica with me because those are the people at that time in my life are still to a large degree at this time in my life that I trusted the most. That I felt like would I could connect with them. They would. Rosa has her people. She could connect with Joe, Jessica, and I felt like those those are the people I could understood this the way we need to move as as movement people. Mm -hmm. um, and then that night, I did not expect. I'll be honest with you. And this is where I had to check my privilege as an as an artist. As an artist, it'd been a long time so I, since I placed myself in a situation that could be that dangerous for me. Mm -hmm. And so from a distance. I was just looking at the optics of it. I could go down to the optics of showing solidarity with the people. But when I actually got there on the ground, it was not about the optics at all. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm not ashamed to say that because I'm I because of I understand that the path in which the process that got me there is necessary for people to hear. The night before I was at uh Farrakhan house because he had a meeting with Brother Ali and Malik Youssef and Jay Electronica, and I went. And me and Jay Electronica recorded a song in the hotel lobby. And I was just like, I'm thinking about going to Ferguson. He, he was like, you should go. And it was just like, it was just this whole thing that just led me there. Um, and so I ended up staying a week. Um, but yeah, that week sort of changed my life. And it made me want to stay in tough, 
touch with a Tef and Tori. And when they came to New York to visit, we would we would build a powwow. And um, I, I, I wanted to uh, contribute more than just my presence. And so I tried to raise money. I didn't try to ra I raise some money with a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and we gave it to some people down there. That was, that was very difficult very difficult process to raise that money and to make sure that we did it did that the right way. And um, even in all the difficulty and even in us dying all our eyes and crossing our T's and make sure they didn't try to why Clef John us out here. Um, even in doing all of that, they still came for us. So it's like, that was one of the hardest things that I, uh, that I ever had to do and made me understand why people stay away from that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually want to mention that you, you know, so you raised what it was one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars on GoFundMe. I know you're too modest. My, to say it, my so. goal was ten thousand, so I definitely wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but but then you set up what you call an action support committee, right? Mm -hmm. So you found people who were who had expertise in fundraising, and you mm -hmm. got with them, and you know, you you figured out how to grant that money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually an important point for folks who are artists um, who want to do community work that, you know, you do actually have to create structures. So even if people did come after you, you know, after that, because a lot of people are never satisfied, I still thought that, you know, it was an incredible thing that you created this committee and also that you documented it in your book, um, because I you know, I, I think one of the great things about your book is it really does marry the culture with the politics. And in a lot of ways, it creates a blueprint for people who don't have the entry point that you had, you know, growing up in a cultural nationalist household. Well, so we're you. about to go to questions and I like- I want to add on to that, to that. Oh, sure, sure. I want to add on to that point because um, I just want to say that the lesson, I, I want to be clear about the lesson. If I had to do that again, have no regrets about doing it. But if I had to do it again, I don't think I wouldn't, let me just say this, instead of say if I had to do it, instead of setting up an imaginary scenario, right? Um, I would not encourage an artist who doesn't have fundraising experience and doesn't have experience working, like actually being a member of or, an or, activist organization mm -hmm. to try to do what I did. Hmm. And the reason is, is because I'm glad I did it. I know what I know because I did it. Mm -hmm. But what happens is you open yourself up to so much criticism. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're Wyclef or me or Sean King or who or anybody who's out there in the space, you know, who's trying to raise money, whether they're right or wrong, all that shit, all that, all that stuff is gonna is going to make it harder on you to participate in in a real way in the movement. And I, I would say that leave the fundraising to the people who actually do it and lend your voice to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a smarter play. And I think over, the overall point is as an artist, don't try to jump out in front with your plan or your idea. Mm -hmm. Get behind the activists when it comes to that. I find mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a way smarter, smarter play. And, and I say that because I'm glad I set up that committee, but I gotta be honest with you Akiba because this is, this is a family conversation. You know what I'm saying? Um, God bless every single person who was a member and supported me with the Action Support Committee. We started with 12 people. By the time we finished, it was like three, four of us. Yeah. And I don't blame anybody because mm -hmm. it's like the way in which everything is talked about on social media, the way in which people in Ferguson were going at each other at the time we were doing it, all mm -hmm. that stuff was, was very, very hard for people who are just trying to focus on the work. And the, the, people who, the people who joined it, whether they left or whether they stayed by me, mm -hmm. I, man, I appreciate them so much because they, they help uplift me. And they helped, um, they, just, they just really, I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Um, mm -hmm. And so my, 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 that's, I just wanted to share that with, with the audiences that it was something that I tried because I was trying to say, well, look, I've been called this activist rapper this whole time. I've never actually done any activist work besides show. I show up at I show up and do the show, mm -hmm. but I was going to do the show for free anyway. Like I'm, I could rap about our condition as black people all day, you know. But I was like, let me try to actually organize. And um, before you jump into that, asking people for money, you got to get your ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's that's an excellent lesson, and that I really appreciate the candor um, with that. So we have to go to questions in one minute, but I really have to ask this anyway. Okay, top five dead or alive. That's that's too hard. You know better than that. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Me, the top five for me is a revolving door. Okay, um, well, at the moment, April 8th, 7.30. At the moment, at the moment, at the moment, I'm gonna go with my brothers because there's, there's different chambers in my top five. So I'm gonna go with the chamber that's my brothers and that's, that's Yasin Bey, Black Thought, Farrell Manch, Common. I'm gonna throw Jean Grey in there. Okay, okay, cool. So I don't know, how are we doing the questions here? Hello, how are you? Hey, what's up, Chuck? What's up, Clarence? Thank you, Akiba, and thank you, Talib. What a fantastic, I, I, would, I would love to go in and hear more about the, the conversation. Akiba asked some fantastic questions, but of course, yeah. you know, we have audience members who have asked questions as well. Um, and the first question that I'm going to read uh, is from Anslim Akwame. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Pardon me if I'm mispronouncing your name. They ask, what are your thoughts about the shift from the predominantly conscious hip hop of the 80s to what it is today? What do you think led to the breakdown in the conscious messaging contained in hip hop music? Well, I gotta be honest, um, Akiba and I spoke earlier about um, how the hip hop of today, the consciousness is not worn on the sleeve as much. Um, but as someone who's been doing conscious hip hop for a long time, it's very seductive and very sexy to say that the radio doesn't play any conscious music, to say that there's no example, like to say, to, to think that all the conscious stuff was back in the day and there's no conscious stuff now. But I watched the Grammys this year. And while I saw, you know, uh, Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B do an incredibly uh, artistically sensual performance, um, I also saw an awful lot of progressive politics, an awful lot of conscious performances from uh, Lil Baby to the to the black girl who sang the country music. I don't know her name. Um, and I think that we sort of get caught up in having this, it, it's 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 sort of like real hip hop-ish to always say that it's not going that we don't see enough of it. But I think that it's smarter and more efficient for us to celebrate what we do see. And I think if we start to celebrate what we do see more often, we will see more of it. I mean, my God, we talked about J. Cole and Kendrick in this conversation. They are not, they may not have the popular radio hits right in this moment, today and right now, but nobody could doubt that they are the giants of this industry. Nobody could doubt the influence of Rhapsody. Um, you know, I saw Saw Rock was charting. She posted an Instagram post about how she's charting. Run the Jewels is one of the biggest rap groups out. You know, they make some uh, ratchet ass music sometimes, but they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, a conscious hip hop group. What J. Cole has done with Dreamville, a JID, Earth Gang, all of that. Like, there's a lot of examples of conscious music that's being successful. Chance the Rapper, um, things that we should spend a lot more time uplifting. And we, we should, we, we, I like Migos and I like, uh, you know, Car uh, Cardi B, I like all that. I like all that, there's space for all of it. Uh, there's, they could do, they do what they do well. I do what I do well, we do we do well over here. Um, but I'm more interested in, in celebrating all the wonderful things that's happening with conscious hip hop. Kendrick Lamar won a Pulitzer surprise. Like it's, it's, it's crazy out here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the next question comes from David Medina. Mm -hmm. He asks, how do you navigate the independence of a music industry which doesn't rely on major labels anymore? Also, if you can speak on it, what happened to the second Black Star album? Um, the second Black Star album is done. Um, it's produced entirely by Mad Lib, and uh, it'll be available as soon as we make the right situation possible. Um, independence for me has been a blessing. Um, I wish I would have gone independent sooner, but you can't have too many regrets in life. Um, I benefited from the major label system. I had a lot of money invested in my music. The reason why records like Get By and The Blast were able to compete in the way in which they did are not just because they're good records, they are good records, but it's because there was a system in place to spend money 
to make sure that I was in the right places and the right radio stations, right marketing. And, you know, and if you don't have that, then you're just, you, you don't have that. You have to find an alternative way to do it. And those, the people who find the alternative way to do it are the rare, 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 the people who find the alternative way to do it independently are the rare, rare exception to the rule. Um, the reason why, part of the reason why I've been successful as an independent artist is because people remember seeing my videos on MTV and BET. People remember seeing me at, at big venues opening for Missy Elliott and, you know, you know, just all the stuff I used to do. So I'm able to parlay that cultural currency and all that love the fans gave to me and into like a, a small but very consistent fan base that will always come to certain venues and always support my music when I, when I got out there. So, I mean, I say all that to say big up to the independent artists who never had a major label support system who never had a billboard or never had someone paying for the records to get on the radio. If you've made it, or you've, if you're successful as an independent artist doing that, then hats off to you. Nikki Duncan Smith asked, if you can, can you talk about how Brooklyn, where'd the question go? Oh, can you talk about how Brooklyn plays a role as a character in your book? Well, first of all, <laughs> well, I love to Nikki Duncan Smith. That's one of my favorite people. Um, Brooklyn, my parents are the greatest. Brenda and Perry Green, they're so great. And they did such a great job raising me and my brother. Um, but as great as the job they did, Brooklyn raised me in equal measure. And so Brooklyn is definitely a character in the book. There's a uniqueness about the stew in which us Brooklynites come out of that is the reason why whenever you go any place in the world in any city in, on the planet, if you're in a party, you say, where's Brooklyn at? People are gonna at least pretend that they're from Brooklyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so that's no, my love for Brooklyn is no disrespect to any other borough, any other place, you know, but Brooklyn is definitely the planet and Brooklyn is definitely uh, a character in my book, a character in my life and um, part of the major, major inspiration behind my output as an artist. Uh, the next question, I, and this is a question I think, um, it's for both you and Akiba. Akiba, you've call, covered call, culture for so many publications. Charmaine wants to know, she asked, I've been pondering points made here and trying to figure out as children of the golden era of the late 80s and the early 90s rap, well, Akiba can comment on this. Where do we think, where, do we, where did we drop the ball of consciousness? Wow, okay, that's the question. Um... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, we we didn't drop the ball. That's first of all. Um, anytime a subculture or I would say a black culture becomes um, commodified, there's going to be a transfer in the people who are there to analyze it and to write about it. And so we didn't so much drop the ball as much as um, I think that the landscape changed quite a bit. Um, and the last thing I'll say, because I really do think people want to hear from Talib on this, is just that, you know, everything has a season. And so, you know, I did a lot of work at The Source. I did a lot of work at Bob Dixon. I did a lot of work, you know, I, I you know, used to review albums. I used to talk to I used to do all of that. Um, and now I work for a criminal justice news site. And the reason why is because tastes change. And also because, you know, sometimes that work can be extremely um, difficult. And I think the important thing really is to make sure that you pass it on to the next generation. So it's not so much that we stay in the same space and occupy it forever is that we make sure that there's some continuity between, again, the people who came before us, us, and then the people who come after us. Yeah, um, I wanna take this opportunity to, to say how much um, I'm a fan of the work that Akiba Solomon has done. And um, to know that it feels very full circle for me to, for, to, to you know, I, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were so, uh, young and fresh faced and we didn't we didn't have I don't know if you had a, a, a job but I was getting fired all the time um, <laughs> you know we um, 
we didn't, we didn't, we uh, imagine this, Akiba, imagine, like, could you have imagined that we would be doing this? No. I, I mean, either. I and know. so, uh, you know, the fact that you were there when I was at Nkiru trying to sell Four to Five Live, and now we both have books <laughs> is, 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 is very dope to me. Um, but yeah, again, I'll, I'll echo, I don't want to repeat what I said to the other question about conscious hip hop, because I feel like it's a similar um, question. But to, to make a, a, a different point, um, I agree with Akiba that it's not on us. And I think that why would we expect conscious or progressive or subversive art and music to dominate the mainstream? I mean, when it does, we should celebrate it. When Public Enemy becomes one of the biggest rap groups of all time, when the Fugees, Outkast, all these groups over, over time have become some of the biggest rap groups of all time, very conscious hip hop groups, um, we should celebrate that because that the world is not designed for that music to do that. Art from the time that they first started selling music and putting it on the radio has always been the confectionery pop candy, not substance, violent, sexual. It's always been that. It's always been that. And the, as long as the status quo is the way it's, it, it is, it's always going to be that. So I applaud the passion that makes a real hip hop fan really be concerned about this. Obviously I do look at my career as evidence. I've, 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 my, as evidence that I agree with people that hip hop needs more consciousness. I've dedicated my entire life to it. Now my kids do conscious rap music. Like I've, my whole family, we've dedicated our entire being to creating this. So what I could just say is I would love the conversation around that to shift to, hey, have you heard this new song by this artist? Hey, look at Talib Kweli's new album. Hey, look at Saw Rock's new album. Hey, look, instead of like, why can't I hear no conscious music? Well, it's out there, especially right now when we talk about how the distribution systems are falling by the wayside. There is no excuse for you at this point. At, you can, if you hear a new song, you can put your phone literally in the air and for free, if you have the right app, it'll just be on your phone. Like, what are we even talking about? I have music at the, at the tip of our fingers. Um, you can decide that I only want to listen to 70s psychedelic rock and roll for six months, and you could do it for free if you wanted to. So I think it's on us to be conscious consumers. It's on us to curate our own playlists and stop letting these corporations tell us where hip hop is. Stop letting these corporations tell us that because this is on the radio, this is what you need to pay attention to. We are the boss of the radio. If we turn it off, like Deb Press said, turn off the radio, things will change. All right. Dr. Brenda Green asks, okay. <laughs> you are a musician and a lyrical poet. What is your process for composing lyrics? <laughs> being born. How about that? Let's start with being born. That's the first thing I had to do was be born. So thank you to Dr. Brenda Green. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I just did my mother's podcast and she asked me this question and she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't satisfied with my answer. So that's why she's asking me again. Um, for every song is different. Um, every song is different. I'm working on a project right now. I'm working on a secret project. I was about to let it out the back, but I can't. I just realized. I'm working on a project now that's, that's very exciting to me. And I'm working with an artist that has pushed me in ways that I would not normally push. Normally, I'm the fastest writer in the room. Normally, I'm the one who comes up with the ideas the quickest, but this artist has pushed me. And I'm like, whoa. And so I'm just writing on my phone. I'm just walking around and stuff is jumping out at me. But I mean, I've written on the, I've written on the back of like the throw up bag on the airplane, when you're sitting on the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've written on walls. I've come up with songs in the booth. Um, I mean, every, every song has a different process. Now- I, Also I, not just the process, is it where you are at the moment? Sometimes, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There's, there's location. Like when I with the book, the book was a different thing. The book I wrote most of the book on planes. I started out the um, started out the book the first with the Puerto Rico. Spent two months in Puerto Rico and banged out th like a like the first third of the book, maybe the first half of the book, and then I spent four or five years, maybe three or four years. Hemming and Han, not Hemming and Han, but like being nervous about writing and what I was gonna share. Um, and so 
Yeah, and now that I think about it, I'm, as I'm thinking, I'm, I'm answering, I'm thinking as I'm answering. And I wrote a lot on planes. A lot of, in the last few years, the book, the lyrics, I wrote a lot on planes. It's on the go on my phone. And uh, ever since the pandemic, I've had to completely switch up how I work and how I operate. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It just, it's, it's fluid, it's a fluid process. This kind of segues, your answer segues into a question that someone asked, I don't know the person's name, but they said you took us on, and you mentioned it just now about writing your book. They said, you took us on an incredible, unforgettable journey with this book. Can we expect any more books from you? Oh, I'd love to write a new book. I actually started taking notes for a new book the other day. Um, but I have, I, now that I see what's possible, now that I'm a published author and that's a real thing in my life, um, I have many different ideas of what I could do next. And this is a question similar to something you mentioned earlier. Nathan Weiser asked, is there any under the radar rapper for the last, from the last few years that you are a fan of? Under the radar. Um, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask about that. I really like, um, I'm a fan of Griselda and what they do. I like Stove God Cooks and his new album, Rock Marciano. Um, that's very tough guy rap though. Um, I like Sir Rock's new album a lot. That's why I keep mentioning it. Uh, who else am I listening to? Uh, IDK. It's a young man named IDK, uh, who's largely independent. Huge fan of what he 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 does. Amani Fela, who is my son, is incredible. Diani Shea, uh, Diani Ashe, who's my daughter, she is incredible. Nico is. Thank you, Nikki. Of course, Nico is. Nico is is on my label. Uh, he is a Brazilian artist that was born in Orlando. He's one of the best rappers I ever heard. Shout out to Nico is absolutely. Uh, bringing us to the cultural the popular cultural things now. Miss Harley asked, would you be interested in doing a versus battle? Whose catalog would be appropriate or fun to hear track for track? <laughs> well, I think the most obvious choice for me for versus battle would be versus most deaf, um, aka Yasin Bey, um, cousin Black Star. But I think a more exciting versus battle would be me versus common. Cause I feel like y'all see me, y'all seen it would be it would be a strictly, strictly celebrating because we with so many records we have together. And I got a lot of records in common, but I feel like me and Common musically, there's like a, a level of competition there that might be fun. Lauren Kelly asked, in the past, in the past decade, we've seen the genre of hip hop based memoirs increase tremendously compared to years in the past. Why are hip hop artists becoming more interested in sharing their life stories in this medium? And what do you think this genre offers to the field of black literature? I'm gonna be completely honest. Most of the hip hop memoirs have ghostwriters, and most of them are just things that are just money making ideas. They're things that are put in the marketplace to just make money. Obviously, rappers are highly intelligent people. Obviously, rappers are very interesting and entertaining. So, if you get the right team, the right ghostwriter, the right publishing company, you bang out a book put it up, you get a bestseller. Um, and it's just a way to make money. It's just a, an additional revenue stream. And there's nothing wrong with that. As far as it being a, a contribution to black literature, it absolutely is. Just because these are money plays doesn't mean that these stories are not being told. And these stories are being told first, no, well not first hand because it's ghost writers a lot of times, but these stories are being told at least from the, from the perspective uh, of the artists. And um, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy reading these books. I enjoy reading these books. I think they're necessary. LL Cool J's book, DMX book, LL Cool J's and Make My Own Rules, DMX Earl, um, you know, prayers up for DMX, definitely. Um, Ice T's book, The Ice Opinion. These are hip hop biographies that I remember reading when I was working at Inkiru Books and that era. And they inspired me because these guys did these books at the height of, heights of their careers. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I'm, I could do that one day. And so the hip hop biography has definitely inspired me to be a writer. Good. I, I may be mispronouncing this person's name. Oma Aima Albachiri, mm -hmm. they ask, what do you think of the commodification of wokeness and, conscious, and consciousness? Companies can now put out Black Lives Matter adverts and not necessarily reflect that within the company or with how they engage with Black and pop customer bases. How do you navigate who to collaborate with? As far as uh, uh, like a corporate interest, uh, that's that's a great question. I, you know, 
people got to remember, this is not a new thing. Um, you know, I remember flipping through Ebony and Jet magazines and seeing how companies advertise and how, how they co-op movements. And, you know, I remember, you know, to this day, I think to, right to this day, McDonald's plays the same commercial on Martin Luther King's holiday that I, that I remember seeing when I was a kid. If you could light a candle for everything he's done. And it's like, come on, bro. You, you we can't get a new MLK commercial. Like, exactly. like y'all playing us. Y'all think all we have to do is do something black and sing a, 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 a soulful song and we can run this commercial for 40 years? Um, and so they, they've been doing this. Um, it makes sense for them to do it now. But I, I, the question actually was, uh, was how do I choose who to work with? Um, it's hard. That's a hard choice because as an artist, people don't buy music anymore. People don't, go, people don't buy music anymore. It's very hard for an artist who's not a multi-platinum seller to make a living. So when you get an opportunity to work with a corporation, as an artist, you're like, well, here's an opportunity to pay my bills, feed my family. So a lot of artists have trouble uh, saying no. In the hip hop space, the only artists I can think of that haven't done anything real corporate like that are like Yasin Bey, Eminem, Andre 3000. Those are the ones I could think of that haven't really, as far as from my generation. Um, with me, I have had positive experiences with corporations. I've had negative experiences with corporations. Um, the, the, the two corporations that I had the most negative experience with are li a liquor corporation and a cigarette corporation. Uh, the liquor corporation, I did a, an advertisement where it's funny because in Cuba Books was involved. I didn't want to do it. I was convinced by my manager to do it. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. More, more money I was making than any show, song, record deal, whatever. And they were gonna, I was gonna do a voiceover for a liquor spot. Wasn't gonna say my name. If you knew my voice, you knew it was me, but it was just a voiceover. And uh, the deal was you couldn't, I didn't wanna film anything and you couldn't take no pictures of me and anything. And they, what they did was they took a still cut out of a picture from someplace else, which somehow they got the license to it. And they made a cardboard, a life-size cardboard cutout. And they put it in all the hood liquor stores all across the nation. So let's say somebody was going to like the hood liquor store to buy some Hennessy or something, you see Talib Kweli. And so that was a lesson for me, like these people are dastardly. And I ended up giving some money to Incurable Books because that's what Incurable Books was in dire straits. Now that's how I justified in my mind it was worth doing. I was like, okay, I can get some money to the bookstore, I can feed the fam, buy some sneakers or whatever, it's trivial stuff is on my mind. Um, but yeah, in retrospect, I'm glad I did it because I learned that lesson in real time, but it wasn't worth it. I did, an, I did a tour for a lot of money with a cigarette company, but three days into the tour, I couldn't, I couldn't do the tour anymore because they would place their ads for the cigarettes all over the venues. And I just, I was like, I can't be a part of this. Um, so it's been tough. There are corporations that I've worked with that I've had the opposite experience with, where it was great, felt like they got it, they understood it. Um, but my rule is, is at this point, no cigarettes, no alcohol. <laughs> Uh, the next question comes if the person that, well, he said, owner, mm -hmm. Talib, can you tell us the moment you were clear about being a conscious artist, your dad? I said my dad had asked the question? I believe so. Okay. Okay. Well, let me think. What was the moment? What's up, dad? Uh, the moment I knew that I was a conscious artist was in high school. I started a rap group with my cousin Sada and my friend Justin. We call they they have a group called Dual Live now. Um, we started a group called GAP. I was Genesis. Sada was DJ Assault, and Justin was the Prophetical Prince. And uh, we used to rap in the lunchroom of Brooklyn Tech High School. And I found that the more conscious and the more uh, uplifting of Black people that Marans were, the better response I got from the lunchroom crowd. So it was like in that high school lunchroom that I knew that consciousness was the path for me lyrically. Well, we have several other questions, but I'm gonna ask this last one. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum Education asks, what are some of your favorite novels of all time? What lit genres are you into? Hmm, okay. Well, favorite novels of all time. I'm not really a novel guy, but I would have to definitely say Bluest Eye uh, by Toni Morrison had a huge impact on me. Um, and um, I, I, that, broke, that book hit me like a sledgehammer. Um, 
the fact that she wrote it at the time when she wrote it, I felt like it was very brave. And um, I felt like it made plain for the, for, the, for the average simplest person, what's wrong with racism. And it did it in the form of a novel. And that last paragraph, I co-opted it and used it for the song Thieves in the Night for the Black Star album. So, and people always give me props for that song. People love that song. And so I got to thank the sister, you know, uh, the, you know, beautiful sister, Toni Morrison, for providing me with inspiration. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, what genres are you into? What lit genres are you oh, into? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like biographies and autobiographies the best, I, I would suppose. Um, and books, yeah, I mean, the book, the book that I wrote is my favorite genre. You know, like what, what Tata Nisi Coates does, where he's talking about his, he's telling a story from his past, but he's also giving his perspective on, on life. That's sort of been my favorite genre of book to read. Okay, cool. Well, there are plenty of other questions, but we're gonna, we're gonna wind things up because we're gonna have closing remarks. I would, first of all, I wanna thank you so much for taking out your time and being with us today because this is a fantastic program. Thank you, Akiba, for joining us. Thank you, Akiba. This thank was fantastic. You. I really enjoyed it. We're now gonna have closing remarks from Dr. Brenda Green. Dr. Brenda Green is professor of English, founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature at Negris College, the city of the University of New York. Green's research and scholarly work include composition, African-American literature and multicultural literature. She is the author of African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas and co-editor of Resistance and Transformation, Conversations with Black Writers and Rethinking American Literature Dr. Green is also the host of Writers on Writing, a weekly radio program that's aired on WNYE on Sundays from 7 to 7.30 p.m. And if anyone doesn't know this by now, Dr. Green is Talib's mom. <laughs> so please welcome Dr. Brenda Green. Thank you so much, Clarence. Uh, this has been such a memorable hey, evening for me. Um, it's memorable just, just really being able to witness to leave, talk about this book that was years in the making, his memoir. Um, it's, it's just been really, really exciting. It's been exciting because um, I like the idea that we were able to look at the fact that as a musician and a lyrical poet, you are also a griot. And we talked about that um, previously, that our poets are our griots. So we are celebrating the the griot, the storyteller, and you are a good storyteller. Thank you. Um, it also um, is, is important because it, it underscores how important it is that we connect um, to other people, to other organizations. So I want to thank uh, Meredith for helping us to celebrate Poetry Month and for having the vision to understand that this is another kind of uh, poetry. As I reflect on, on what we saw tonight, I think about um, what we do to get by. And that's the kind of story that Talib has been telling. And I also think about Sonia Sanchez, where she talks about the fact that all poets, all writers are political and they maintain the status quo or they say something is wrong, let's change it for the better. And that's what we've seen. We've seen ways that uh, Talib has changed things for the better and while doing so, remember that we all stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. So I wanna thank uh, Center for Black Literature team, Clarence Reynolds, the director of the Center for Black Literature, April Silver, our communications and marketing director, Simone Wow, our virtual event manager, Leah Bird, our communications and marketing associate, and Sherelle Williams, our program and outreach associate. I want to thank the Amazon Literary Partnership for sponsoring the John Oliver Killens reading series. And again, thank you, Meredith, um, for a longstanding partnership. I didn't realize that it was over 15 years. I want to thank um, all of our attendees, our Center for Black Literature friends, staff, faculty, and students. And thank you, Akiba Solomon. You were definitely the right choice. Thank you, Akiba, for your thought provoking questions were, you know, really, it's always nice to listen to someone interview another person and they've actually really read the book and <laughs> thought about it. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to um, thank you to Lee 
for your vision, your, your commitment as a writer and as a musician who continues to be a student and seeker of truth and knowledge. And, and you gonna make a black man blush. Vibrating higher. What did you say? So you're gonna make a black man blush. <laughs> okay. So I wanna remind our attendees to complete their evaluation forms. Uh, we really value and need your feedback. And we support our writers by buying their books. That's how we support writers. So you can purchase Talib's book, Vibrate Higher at Incuro Books, which is located on the Quali Club website, www.qualiclub.com. You can purchase Akiba's book, really good to know that it's there, um, How We Fight White Supremacy. And the you've seen uh, the links for the book club in the chat. So please take advantage of that. I also want to encourage you to donate to the Center for Black Literature. No matter how small or how large your donation, we always value it. Your donations really help to keep our programming going. So you can visit the Center for Black Literature at www.centerforblackliterature.org and click on donate. Thank you once again. Stay safe and be well. Good to see everybody. And thank, thank you love to my family and everybody who came through to watch. And thank you to every all the, all the people uh, who helped set this up. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. All right, y'all. Have a great a team. Good night. Good night.